I'm going to preach on something this morning out of uh, Genesis 42 and 28. The title of the sermon is God Has a Plan. God Has a Plan. And what I want to look at is a, a familiar individual in the scripture, name of Joseph. Now, the sermon is going to be a little different. I don't have usually a three or, point, you know, a three or four point uh, outline and stuff, but as I was praying and seeking the Lord for the last several weeks, and stuff, it just, the Lord started working on me and, and I really kind of struggled with a couple different sermons and things and then finally uh, God just showed me to do this, to talk about Joseph. God had a plan, but I want to read one verse that kind of sums up how some of us may have felt sometime in our journey as, as we walk through the life with the Lord. And this is actually talking about uh, when uh, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt during the famine after he had been, uh, Joseph had been in Egypt as a, first as a slave, then as a prisoner, and now governor of the land, second only to Pharaoh. And the famine, they'd first had seven years of plenty, and then there was in, uh, seven years of famine. And over in, um, in Canaan, they'd run out of food, so Joseph's brothers had came before you know, them to, uh, went to Egypt to buy food and grain, and they come back, and that, that first night they, uh, they were bedding down, and, and one of the brothers opened his sack of grain, and suddenly the money that, that they had paid for the grain was still in the sack. It says So this re- verse here in Genesis 42 and 28 says, So he said to his brothers, My money has been restored, and there it is in my sack. Then their hearts failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God has done to us. I was reading through the story that I'd read many, many times before. I hit that verse and I thought, whoa, I've never seen that before. What is this that God has done to us? And it kind of like just smacked me in the face. And I thought, oh God, how I've been there before. Believe me, all the years of Sandy's sickness, many times, God, what are you doing? Other times during the the many years since the 75 when I got saved, there's been many times when I've thought, oh God, what in the world are you doing to us? And I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm sure anybody that's walked with the Lord very long has sometime has said, God, what in the world is going on? I, I, I'm serving you now. I'm following you now. I thought everything was supposed to be rosy and everything was supposed to be great. Well, that's sometimes the story we Christians give to sinners maybe that you get served God and everything be great. But no, that's not always the case. It will be better. God will be with you. God's for you. God's on your side. God will walk through every trial with you. But to say that when you get saved you're never going to have trials and never going to have problems is a fallacy it's not reality men and women of God that we read about in the scripture it's definitely what, not what they experienced and it's not what we experience sometimes in our walk with God we'll look up and say the same thing God what is this that God has done to us I want to go back through the story of Joseph a little bit of course the common children's story that we read about uh, and we teach our children about uh, Joseph and his coat of many colors. Joseph was the, the child of, of Jacob's favorite. No, I won't get on all the story about his dysfunctional family and we can go, that's the whole set of sermons there. Joseph though was Jacob's favorite and he loved, his father loved him very much. So you see how that it starts out in Genesis 42 here. He, uh, he has dreams. Dreams about suddenly it said they were out and his sheath rose up and and stood up and and all of his brothers in their sheaves of grain bowed down to him and he had another dream how the moon and the, uh, the the sun the moon and the stars would all bow down to him and his father rebuked him and said what do you mean you mean that me and your mom and and all your brothers are going to be subservient to you and he kind of got after him and so this dreamer that his brothers called him. He went out to look for him one day as his dad had said, look for your brothers, see how they're doing. We know the story. They looked at him. Here's the dreamer coming, the favorite. Let's just kill him. No, tell you what, here's, here's the traitors. We won't kill him. That won't gain us anything. We'll have to cover up the crime. We'll just sell him. So they sold him for silver, sold him, and he was sent away to uh, Egypt. Can you imagine what was going through his mind? He was sold as a slave into a foreign land. A slave. Thinking of the rest of my life, this is what I'm going to be. But he made the best of it. 
He was a hard worker, conscientious, and God was with him. So you see in his life that he went into a man, uh, it was a servant, uh, sold as a slave to Potiphar, which was an assistant to the king. And before long, he excelled so much that Potiphar made him the chief steward of the home, which is a common practice. And the, you, take of it, you take care of everything, all my finances, all the food and everything and, and, and stuff. So he made him in charge of everything. So in a bad situation, God had blessed him and he was doing good. And then we know the story how this wife come and was lusted after Joseph, Potiphar's wife come and stuff, but he rejected her attempts. And finally, she accused him of trying to rape her. He went from one situation that he'd made, he would worked hard and made good, so he was from a slave. Now he was in the prison. Far worse situation. But even there, he showed his integrity. Now I'm sure he thought many times, God, what have you done to me? Why am I here? First of all, my own brother's, betray me, sell me as a slave. I'm a slave and then I've been lied about unjustly and now I'm in prison. And so we go through the prison and he's been prison for years. And then we know the story of the the, the king, the, the Pharaoh uh, gets upset at his, uh, uh, the uh, baker and the, the cupbearer, puts them in jail, in prison. They have dreams. Joseph prays and says, God can interpret dreams. So he prays. God gives the interpretation. The interpretation comes through. Three days later, the baker is killed and the cupbearer is put back in his position. But they forget. Joseph had told them, when, you, when you're back in your royal position, remember me. I'm here unjustly. He forgot it. So Joseph is still in a prison for over two years. And then Pharaoh has a dream. It disturbs him. He asked all of his uh, soothsayers and magicians and astrologers and all the wise men of the kingdom, and they can't figure out what the dream means. And then finally the cupbearer, which is an assistant to the king, says, wait a minute. I remember now, two years ago, you were upset at me and the baker, and, and I, he went to the, to the story, so, okay, bring him here. So they had him. They pulled him out of prison, cleaned him up, shaved him up, sit him in front of Pharaoh, and now Joseph, first of all, he says, I can't do it. I can't interpret the dream, but I know a God that can. So he gave God the glory right off the bat. And God gave the interpretation. He said, the dreams you had, the two dreams are basically the same thing. One dream was that seven fat cows come up out of the Nile River. The Nile River was their source of water and their source of, uh, of strength and stuff. He said, seven fat cows come up out of the Nile River and uh, were beautiful and fat and, and, and stuff. And then seven more came up that were ugly and lean and skinny and scrawny and they ate up the seven fat cows but they stayed skinny and scrawny. And then seven grain come up, grew, was great and then seven more came up and ate up the same thing. And Joseph said, well, God has told you what's going to happen. You're going to have, the, the nation is going to have seven years of plenty, of bountiful plenty, the greatest harvest we'd ever seen. But then there's seven years of drought coming. So Pharaoh, what does he do? He said, well. And then Joseph gives his opinion. What you really need to do is have somebody that you can trust to store up the grain for the seven good years that God has shown you you're going to have and then sustain you so the seven bad years. And Pharaoh says, yeah, I think I'll do that. How about you? Can you imagine this righteous man that had been, as I did some of the timeline, for 13 years, he'd been a slave and then a prisoner. He woke up in the prison one morning and went to sleep in a palace. He probably woke up the next day and said, wait a minute, I've had this amazing dream that can't be true. Whoa, wait a minute. Huh? Wait, I am. I'm not in the prison anymore. I'm in a palace. I'm in a soft bed and, and, and nice sheets and, and I, I smell food being prepared. It really is good, not the stuff I had to eat before. He, as he did before there in Potiphar's house and there in the, in the prison, he's a man of integrity, and he stores up for the food, and the drought comes, the famine comes. Jacob, meanwhile, and his sons are back there in Israel, in Canaan. They're starting to get hungry. They don't know what's going on. I can imagine what Jacob's thinking. God, you've made a covenant with me. You told me. Oh, God of Abraham, Isaac, 
And, and now you, you, we've been through this. We've been like this. I've even wrestled with you face to face. Now what's going on? We're starving. You've forsaken me for one thing. My, my, my son that I love so much has apparently been dist- killed by an animal. And Jacob all this time had been mourning for his son. This is nine years after Joseph's been made ruler of Egypt because they'd had seven years of good and then there was two years into the famine. So for 22 years, Jacob has been mourning Joseph and then they're about to starve and they hear there's food that they can go buy in Egypt. So the brothers go and they, they go and Joseph recognizes them but he wants to test to see if their hearts changed any. So he accuses them of being spies. No, we're not spies. We're all one man's sons. And so he says, I tell you what, if you're really telling me the truth, I'm going to take one of you and put him in, in jail. And when you go back, but before you can buy any more grain from me, you're going to have to bring your other, your younger brother with me, which was Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin, which Jacob wouldn't let him go, afraid his youngest son would something would happen to him. So on this section here, what I just read, they're picking, the, they bought the grain and they, they leave, they go back and the first day they're stopping to camp. One of the brothers opens his sack to feed, uh, take grain out to feed the donkeys and suddenly his gold's there that he paid. And this, the governor, Joseph, uh, of course they didn't know him as Joseph, had already accused him of being spies had already threatened to put him in prison. And so then they're saying, what is this that God has done to us? See, what they didn't realize was God had a plan. So they go on back home, and Jacob is upset. What are you, why did you tell the governor that I had a younger son? Why did you tell? So they, they run out of food, and then they have to go back. But they said, Father, we got to take Benjamin with us. So finally... When there's, there's no way around it, they're, they're out of food, they're going to starve. He says, okay, take Benjamin back. And Judah, one of the ones that was the ringleader one, uh, of, uh, that decided to sell Joseph, he told him, he said, listen, if I, if I can't bring him back, I'll bear the blame for the rest of my life. So we know the story. They go back. Joseph, they buy the food. Joseph lets them have more food, but he puts the... The, the, their money back in the, their, their sacks again and then puts his personal cup in Benjamin's sack. They head out again. Then he sends the soldiers after him. You've stolen our leader's personal cup. Oh, no, we didn't. So they open it up, and there it is in Benjamin's sack. I'm thinking by this time, they're really thinking, God, what have you done to us? What in the world have you done to us? And when they get back there, Judah goes before Joseph and says, please, don't take him, take me. There was a change in heart, and that's what I think Joseph needed to see, the change in heart. But he begged, he said, I I promised his father that I would bring him back. So you let Benjamin, because they were were saying, we're going to just keep Benjamin here as a slave, and the rest of you can go because he's the one that stole the cup. And Judah went before Joseph and says, no, no, please take me as a slave. I'll be your slave for the rest of my life, but you let Benjamin go, go back because if he doesn't go back, it'll cause our father to die in grief. So finally, Joseph knows that his brothers has changed. So over in Genesis 45, and I want to read this to you. Genesis 45, 4 through 8. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you and the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it is not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all of his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. God, what have you done to us? I'm sure that refrain had been over and over and over in Joseph's mind. God, what did you do to us? 
Why am I here? Why am I going through this? And then his brothers, God, what have you done to us? We made a mistake in the past, but now we've, we're trying to do the right thing and, and stuff. And God, what are you doing to us? And, and Jacob probably thought, Lord, what, what are you doing now? I'm, I'm, I'm at possibility of, of my sons being imprisoned. We're just trying to survive. So after all those years, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And it shows his integrity. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good because God had a plan. He said, there's, not, there's been two years of famine, but there's going to be five more years of famine. And God had a plan. So he sent Joseph. And that dream that Joseph had all those years back, it was correct. It was the plan of God. He put it in his heart. Sometimes when we're walking with God, this life just don't make sense. This is the messed up world. What Adam and Eve didn't know when they when they messed up in the garden. We can't blame them, though. If it had been us, we'd have done the same thing. We do the same thing daily sometimes. The Bible says we've all sinned. We've not, none of us have, 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 all of us come short of the glory of God. And as we look around us, this messed up world, we see all around us, we see that this world is in a mess. But in our own lives, as we're following God, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes we look up in the heaven and say, God, what have you done to us? What have you done to us? I don't understand. But see, God has a plan for your life and a plan for the lives of your family and a plan for this church that sometimes he can't share all of it with you. Just like this last year when Robin, she had been praying for the last several years that verse in Philippians, oh, that I may know you in the power of his resurrection. Oh, or Paul said, oh, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. I remember a year, many years ago, I preached that. I actually, I was here to preach. It was when I was state youth leader, but I was here to preach just on a regular Sunday morning. And uh, I was sitting right up here where we used to have the two seats there. They're in service, and uh, all of a sudden the Lord changed my sermon. He said, preach on that verse, and I'm thinking, what? That's not what I had to preach. I had notes on something totally different, and I said, Lord, if it's, if it's, this is you, he would, Brother McKinley was getting ready to give me that, the, the hand the pulpit to me, and I said, Lord, if that's you, let him have another song. So he was up there just about ready to give me the, the pulpit, and then he said, wait a minute. No, we need one more song. So he turned over, and Lou was on a piano over here. He said, Lou, could you come and sing? Do you sing a special for us? So she got some music out, started to sing it, and said, wait a minute, that's not the right song. So she said, somebody testify. Why? So she got up in the piano bench, and she was uh, looking around for some music, and somebody stood up and testified for a minute, and then she put the music up there, and as she started to sing it, it was the song, Oh, That I May Know You. <laughs> so the Lord gave me a sign. But Brother McKinley come up to me after me. I had preached on, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Brother McKinley came up to me after service. He said, Gary, you preached a really good half sermon. Huh? He said, you forgot the second part. He said, it's not, it's not complete until you re-preach the second part. I didn't understand that then. I do now. Oh, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering because Jesus' life had to include suffering. And the bottom line is many times unless we have hard times, difficult times in our walk with the Lord, we will not be where we need to be with God. Sometimes it takes the difficult times before we're driven to our knees. Abraham Lincoln said one time that he said, many times I've been driven to my knees in prayer by the overwhelming conviction that there was just simply nowhere else to go. When you're facing calamity, when you're facing disaster, when you're facing horrible things, then we go to our knees in prayer. And that's where God wants us to be. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct your paths. It's talking about trust. Sometimes walking for the, with the Lord just to be truthful doesn't make sense sometimes. To be truthful sometimes God calls this thing that just doesn't seem to work out logically. 
we're in financial straits, difficulties, God says, I want you to give more in the offering, to give more. In but God, that doesn't make sense. I'm already having trouble paying my bills, but you want me to give more? But see, when we give more, then that unlocks his ability to bless us. For he is and he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above we can, what we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. I really struggled with this sermon. And then, I, but I really feel like somebody here needed to hear this this morning. God loves you and he cares for you. And sometimes you may have said, God, what in the world are you doing to us? What in the world are you doing to me? What in the world are you, why has this happened to me? Why has this happened to my family? But I want you to know that God has a plan for you. And he loves you. Yes, he sings over you. He delights in you. But he wants to do things in your life sometimes that we may not understand. And sometimes following him means going through heartache. Living in this life just means heartache sometimes because it's a very fallen world. Trust in him. Trust in him. Just like a little child trusting their mom and dad. They may tell them to do things they don't want to do. I remember my oldest son, when the Lord brought him into our life through adoption, he was fascinated with those little things in the wall called outlets. And he was always wanting to pull the little safety tabs off and stick his finger in there. And of course, I'm an electrician, so I know more probably than most what can happen when you stick your finger or stick a, a something in there. So I used to have to spank his hands red. I'd catch him doing it, and I'd, no, Jay, but no. And then the, the, uh, I'd have to spank him red, and he'd look at me and cry, and like, Dad, what are you doing to me? That's a lot of fun playing with that thing on the wall there. But I knew it was dangerous for him. He sees that there's a lot of danger in this world, and that's why he's given us his word, to keep us out of danger. So we can be with him throughout eternity. And he wants us there with him. It's all about trusting him.